afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, um, as you can see, the, the topic that I'm supposed to address is crop load manipulations. What I'm going to look at is uh, pollination, fruit thinning, fruit set, and fruit size. Um, and really that means we, we're starting off at blossom time, um, going to look at the role of, of bees in cross-pollination, look at a fruit set, and if fruit set is too high, how we thin that, if the fruit set is too low, how do we increase fruit set, and then move from the set fruit on to the final fruit size and quality that we need to have at harvest. To start off with uh, the whole pollination process, and uh, again, um, this is quite an important aspect, especially in apples, pears, and plums. And the reason for that is because of incompatibility. Uh, most of our plums, but uh, except maybe with, for African rose, if you look at the current uh, cultivars, but also our apples and pears uh, cannot fertilize themselves, so we need to make use of cross-pollination. Uh, for instance, having a, a Royal Gala orchard with some Granny Smith trees in there, and we need to get the Granny Smith pollen onto the uh, stigma of the, the Royal Gala apple uh, flower, and that could lead then to fertilization. If we do not have that cross-pollination, it will not lead to fruit set uh, because we won't have a, a, enough seed development. I know there are a number of uh, pear cultivars for, that actually set with very few seeds, um, but even in that case, we quite often still uh, make sure that we have uh, cross-pollination available. Now, in the case of these fruit types, um, cross-pollination happens through insects, and really the only insect that we can control in the orchard and manipulate in the orchard are honeybees. Um, and luckily for us, the honeybees are attracted by the colorful petals of the flowers and also the nectar and the pollen that the flowers produce. Um, but there is a big difference in the attractiveness of different fruit types to bees. Um, I've just seen a very recent study again where people have compared conference uh, pears with, with Jonagold apples. Um, but the biggest differences we really get are the following. Um, firstly is the amount of nectar that the flower produces. The more nectar it produces, obviously the more attractive it would be to a bee that wants to collect the nectar. And unfortunately, in this case, um, we find that pears have the most unattractive flowers um, due to relatively low nectar production, whereas apples are quite a bit better than that. Um, then also the composition of the nectar, which type of sugar is in there, whether it's sucrose or fructose or glucose. Uh, apparently, and I don't know who did this research, but they say that if you have equal amounts of those three sugars available in the nectar, that is the most attractive to a bee, um, but generally speaking, the higher the sucrose, the better, and that also makes apple flowers generally more attractive than uh, pear flowers. And then also the concentration of the nectar. So it's the amount, the, the composition, but also how, uh, how concentrated the sugar is in the nectar. Now that obviously depends also on the time of day that you're collecting nectar. If you collect it early in the morning and there's been some dew, that nectar will be slightly diluted. Um, if you collect it in the middle of the day from the same flowers, you will find that it's a bit more concentrated because of evaporation of, of the moisture. But again, generally speaking, apple flowers are more attractive um, as far as that goes as well than pear flowers. Um, so what does it mean? We can't change it, although I know there's some research being done currently where people are trying to change the composition of the nectar to make it more attractive to bees, um, but that's still quite a, a long way off. Um, what we can do is say we realize that our pear flowers are less attractive, so we bring in more bees um, than we, we, we would normally do, for instance, in an apple orchard. There's something else that um, I find quite in interesting is that if we look at the flowers, even within one fruit type like apples, um, they're not all the same between the different cultivars. 
For instance, um, on this side here, you can see this bee is working from the top right into the, the bottom of the, or the receptacle of that flower. So it's in contact with the, the pollen as it's working in there and it's also uh, in contact with the stigma. Um, in this case, it's working from the side. It's collecting nectar in this specific case, but it's not actually in contact with the pollen or the stigma. Um, and we have a lot of cultivars where bees tend to do more side foraging um, rather than top foraging. And we should know this because it means we need to um, make more bees available um, if this, this is the case. Also, some bees are programmed by the queen uh, in the hive to go and collect pollen. And you can see it very clearly on the hind legs. That's where the pollen is sitting whereas this bee has been programmed as a worker to collect nectar. Um, so depending on what the flower looks like um, and also what the aim of the bee is, um, some of them will be more effective in cross-pollination than others. Another aspect um, is looking at the, the actual flower anatomy. You can see in this case the stigmas are lower than the anthers. In this case it's at the same level and in this case they're sticking out above the anthers. Um, and in, in such a situation, you can easily find the bee collecting pollen without actually touching the stigmas. And it won't be very effective um, in, in pollination. Um, again, we can't change that. This is a, a genetic trait of the different cultivars. But we have to be aware of that, that we need to possibly bring in more beehives um, to get effective pollination. Um, as you can see in this case, uh, the bee is collecting um, pollen, as you can see from the hind legs. It's collecting the pollen, but it's not nearly touching the stigmas, because the stigmas, and this is typical of a granny smith, is sticking up uh, for, f above the, the actual anthers. Uh, also, the sa shape of the petals. Um, you can have a more cup-shaped petals, or you can have what we call the aircraft carriers, um, where the bee can easily land on top here, work, oops, work down um, collecting nectar without touching any of the anthers or the stigmas. In this case, it has to work from the top because of the shape of the flower. Again, it's not something we can change, but we have to be aware of that. Um, in this case, more important is the width of the, the gaps between the anthers uh, or the stalks. There's no space in there, so the bee will come in from the top to collect nectar in this case, it can stick its tongue through be between those stalks and collect nectar um, from the side. And then the last one is just the, the, the shape of the stamens, um, whether they're very upright or sort of umbrella shaped like they are in this case. And to summarize, um, this is work done in France. Um, when you actually watch the, the bees and, and when they go into the flowers to pollinate, or actually they're not going there to pollinate, but they're going to collect the pollen or the nectar, um, you can see that on something like a Crips red, rosy glow, Crips pink, um, all the same family, they tend to allow for top foraging. So it's very good for, for pollination because the bees are working from the tops. Um, whereas in some of the other cultivars, like goldens, grannies, you very often find that they're working from the side. So far less effective in, in doing the job. OK, just very briefly on um, bees themselves. I'm not a specialist on bees. But bees are very sensitive to the climate. Um, they normally don't go and work or go out of the hive when temperatures are below 10, 12 degrees centigrade. Um, they will stay inside the hive and not, not fly out. If it's very windy um, or whether if it's quite cloudy and rainy, uh, l low light intensity, the bees also tend to be less active and stay in the hives rather than go out. Now we can't really change that except that we can place the hive in a place where temperatures are generally higher, where you don't get accumulation of, of uh, cold air. Um, but what we also need to do is if we know that the spring has been very cold, and we therefore expect bee activity to have been low, we must realize that when we come to thinning and fruit set that we might have a problem because the bees were, were less active. Um, we cannot uh, rely on wind pollination. Um, 
co in comparison to many other fruit types, for instance, pistachios or uh, avos, where the, the tree is, is designed for wind pollination, um, the apple pollen is relatively heavy, doesn't fly that far, um, and we cannot uh, determine exactly how much pollination will take place through wind. It, it does play a role, so we do get some wind uh, pollination happening um, and, and transfer of pollen that way, but it's not something we can rely on. Um, what is actually quite interesting is we, we tend to think that the bee, when it leaves the hive, it flies to, say, the royal gala flower, and then it needs to fly on to the granny flower. Um, to be able to carry the pollen from the one cultivar to the next. Um, this generally doesn't happen because a bee tends to work down one single row and tends to go back to the trees where it's been before. So it doesn't generally work from one tree to the next, to the next, to the next, carrying the pollen with it. But what happens is when that bee goes back, having visited, say, the royal gala flower, it flies back into the hive, it will... Um, rub against the bee that has actually visited the granny tree and they will exchange the, the pollen between themselves in the hive and then actually go back to the tree where they were before but carrying the foreign pollen w with them. Okay, so it's very important when we uh, plant pollenizers to make sure that we, we try and facilitate cross-pollination um, and obviously these uh, pollenizers have to be compatible. So we basically have two options. Um, the one is where we uh, know that we have to rely on a lot of cross-pollination and generally the effective pollination period is very short where we will plant 50% of one cultivar and 50% of the other cultivar. Now that can either be done like this where we have two solid rows of one cultivar followed by two solid rows of the next and then moving on to the, the first cultivar again or we can alternate the rows. Okay, this will give you 50% of cultivar A and 50% of cultivar B. Uh, typical way we would do it is with uh, a sun gold plum and a letitia, for instance, um, where the sun gold needs a lot of cross uh, or pollen. Um, because of a relatively short effective pollination period, we need to make sure there's enough pollen of the other cultivar. Um, the other option that we have is only planting 10% cross pollinators or pollinizers. Um, like this, where every tenth tree in the row is, is another cultivar, and 90% of the, the orchard would be the main cultivar. Uh, in this case, we can sometimes afford to plant uh, the 10% of the trees um, to a cultivar that's not really of economic interest, um, but in the first situation, we obviously have to make sure that both uh, cultivars are of e economic importance. Okay, very important when we bring in bees is um, to bring in strong colonies um, of naive bees. Uh, what they mean by that is a strong colony will have a, a young queen bee with all the worker bees in different age groups, um, so bees in all different age, ages available. Um, there are also figures about how many bees uh, per frame, etc., etc. Um, what we mean by naive um, bees means that they, they shouldn't know any better. Okay, especially if you bring them into a pear orchard, um, if they've been into a, an, an orchard where, for instance, citrus, where the, the flowers are very attractive, the, the, the nectar is very attractive, very high concentrations, the, the aroma of the flowers is very nice, then those bees would not actually like to go into a pear orchard. Um, it's you know, really... Uh, not a very attractive flower to visit. So bring in bees that do not know any better and that haven't been working in, in uh, fields where they had more attractive flowers to, to work on. Um, to, there's always been a question as to whether one should place your hives um, in single hives in an orchard or whether one should group them. A lot of the literature will say that we have to group hives together so that the, the hives will warm each other up um, and the bees will become active more or earlier in the morning. Um, it's probably not a big issue in South Africa because our springs aren't that cold. Um, but in Europe, they would, or northern Europe, they would definitely place four hives um, against each other so that the hives warm up each other and the bees become active earlier. The distance between hives 
Uh, again, this is according to the literature. Um, I think it depends really on the cultivar and on the fruit type. You place them um, more hives in an orchard. Uh, if you have a less attractive um, crop, for instance, pears, the average we normally say is 2.5 hives per hectare. Um, I think in pears we can go slightly higher and apples we might even go slightly below that. Although I don't think it's worth our while to try and save money uh, on the number of hives that we bring in. Um, if, you, if you look at the cost per hive, and even if you just increase your fruit set by a ton, you've, um, you can bring in many, many hives for, for the price of that. Um, where you place them is very important, um, normally at the end of a row, um, but we also have to try and place them, and I know it's not always possible, that they receive morning sun so that the hive warms, warms up very quickly and the bees become active, move out of the hive as soon as possible and start working. Um, don't place the hives where there's um, air, it's sort of against a, um, a slope um, or in the lower parts of the orchard because that's where the cold air in spring accumulates and you will not have very active bees early in the morning. Um, we normally don't want to put the hives directly onto the ground um, and the reason for that is that the hive, uh, the, the soil itself is very cold so it will keep the hive colder um, early in the morning and it will take longer to warm up so we normally place it slightly away from the ground um, but also important not to place it where if we do irrigate and I know it's not necessary maybe some in, in the Western Cape always but we have areas where we start irrigating um, that you don't wet the hives uh, for just an example of whatever you want to use um, this is just a, one of the, the bulk bins, fruit bins that one can use um, on a pallet and very important in this case um, make sure this is a, a micro sprayer sitting there um, if you would switch on the irrigation you will wet those hives and that's the last thing you want to do to a bee um, in this case uh, it's in the western cape so the chances of, uh, of actually using the irrigation at that point um, was l slim so it's fine to, to place them there uh, the other option is to put them higher than the the spitter, I don't know to what extent you can see it, but that's the irrigation water going out and it's below where the hives are. Um, and this is a cherry orchard in the US. Um, you can see the number of hives are put very close together to try and warm up um, each other. Okay, then very important is to get rid of competing plants, um, especially if you have an unattractive pear flower. Um, you don't want the bees to be uh, sidetracked and going elsewhere. Um, this is what we very often see, is the bees actually not working in the pear trees. Um, there's a nice low row of, of weeds sitting between the rows um, and apparently yellow flowers are more attractive, yellow and blue flowers are more attractive to bees than, than white. Um, so make sure that the weeds are gone by the time the bees come in. Um, this is, is another photograph showing, um, in this case you can see the pollen very bright yellow pollen on the hind legs of those bees. They were flying in a, or visiting canola fields next to the orchard rather than actually visiting um, the apple trees in this case. So if you have more attractive fields next to it, um, that could be quite dangerous in terms of actually having effective pollination. Okay, your timing when you bring in um, is around about 10% bloom. You shouldn't bring in the hives too early because there needs to be some flowers on the trees so that they actually start working in the orchards. Um, you have to be very careful with your um, co pest control. Uh, not only if you spray insecticides because obviously insecticides can kill bees. Um, so even if you spray something like carbaryl as a thinning agent, um, it's very, very effective in killing bees. So make sure that either you have the bees taken out of the orchard before you come in with those chemicals or you have to close the hives at night and spray the chemicals at night. Um, even fungicides uh, are often um, detrimental to pollination, not because it will kill the bee but because the bee doesn't like the smell. You all know what, it, what, how your, what your fingers smell like when you've been in an orchard and you've touched the trees. Um, that same smell the, the bees find uh, as a repellent and they will actually not go into orchards that have been sprayed. Um, obviously there are things we need to spray during that time but we have to be very careful with that.
And then bees also need water available um, for them. Uh, and if, if you don't have enough dew or rain during that period, it it's sometimes sense, makes sense to, to bring in some water for the bees. Okay, very important if you do plant um, your cross-pollinators is that they should overlap in flowering. Now I know this is, a, is not a, as easy said as done, um, or it's easier said than done. Um, quite often in this specific case, for example, these pear or trees would in most seasons flower at the same time, but because they have different chill requirements, um, depending on the amount of winter chilling received and the, uh, the, the heat units received in spring, in some seasons they will not overlap. And obviously um, then even if you bring in a lot of bees, you're not going to have very effective cross-pollination. And just another example um, of a, some trees in full bloom, whereas these trees are still at about green tip, um, it's also not going to be very effective uh, in terms of cross-pollination. Okay, um, move on to the next topic, uh, fruit drop or fruit set. <coughs> what we typically see in an orchard, and these are actual figures from, from eight-year-old apple trees, we start off with thousands of flowers or flower clusters, and we end up with a certain number of fruit at the end of the, of the season at harvest. What generally happens is this very first, very strong fruit drop that occurs just after flowering. These are mostly flowers that were not pollinated at all or were self-pollinated, so not with compatible pollen or they were pollinated too late. Um, so there are many reasons why they don't set um, and those little flowers will just drop. Um, then we very often have what we call the November drop uh, or a second drop. Um, this is sometimes not very, uh, a, a very large drop of fruit, um, quite often due to uh, too heavy initial fruit set could lead to fruit drop, but also because of very strong shoot growth competition um, that could induce uh, that, that second drop. And then the last one uh, is what we call the Hartseerfall, um, happens just before harvest, uh, quite often a uh, due to uneven ripeness of fruit, but also because of uh, mechanical reasons where fruit push its, each other out of the clusters, or where you have, uh, for instance, pink ladies with very short stems, um, they push against the branches and, and some fruit fall, um, and as they drop, they knock off some other fruit from the tree as well, and we might lose some fruit at the end. Now the big question is, whatever we end up with at that point um, needs to be of the right size for us to, to make an, uh, a, a profit. So we will sometimes have situations, and this is more often the case in pears and plums, um, that we end up often this natural process of drop with too few fruit on the trees, and we somehow have to either reduce the drop here or at this point to increase the fruit numbers. In the case of apples, we generally won't have enough natural fruit drop and we actually have to stimulate additional fruit drop during this early phase of, of um, the, the fruit development. Okay, so it depends on your situation and it's very important if you have an orchard that you know what should be your total yield, what should be the total fruit numbers that you have per tree and if you find that you have too few to try and establish where you lose them. Do you lose them during this early stage of, of the, the drop pattern, or do you lose them at this point, or hopefully not at that point, I think it'll be very clear if you lose them at the, towards the end. Um, if you lose them during this early part, very often you will find that your pollination or your cross-pollination is not optimal, and you have to work on that, and there are different ways of doing it. You can, I think I've lost some slides somewhere along the la line, but um, you can bring in more cross pollinizers um, by top working certain trees or putting grafts on trees, bringing in bouquets, all sorts of different techniques that you can use there. To improve the pollination, you can bring in more bees um, to try and make sure that you, you get the pollen transferred um, at the right time. Okay, let's first look at the situation where we end up with too many fruit and we have to do th fruit thinning. Now the main reasons for fruit thinning would be to improve fruit size and quality. 
and especially fruit color. And then also to make sure that we have an adequate return bloom the next season. So we thinning fruit for, for those, basically those two reasons. Um, we want the right size and obviously the size, whatever is the right size, is dependent on which market you're producing your fruit for. So you've got to know, am I sending fruit to the school program in the UK where they want small fruit? Or am I sending fruit to the far east where they want large fruit, whatever. So you're preparing your orchard to produce the right size fruit for the right market or the market that you um, are going to sell that fruit in. And then in terms of quality, as I said before, it's mostly fruit color that's important here. But also very important is that we don't have too few flowers the next season so that we, um, we need enough flowers to again set a good crop in the, in the following season. And one of the main reasons for not having enough flowers is because of a too heavy crop load in the current season. Okay, I'm not talking about flower initiation and differentiation and development at this point, so just bear with me. If you have too many flowers this year, uh, too many fruit this year, you're going to have too few flowers next year. Okay, so how do we go about thinning? Um, I can't go into any details here, but we can use mechanical thinning, we can use hand thinning, we can use chemical thinning or combinations of the three. Um, so it depends really on the, the fruit type, um, which way you're going to address this uh, or start doing your thinning. Um, if, if we talk about mechanical thinning, uh, the, the two options really that we have currently available would be to use a machine like the Darwin, which is here active thinning, actively thinning um, nectarine orchards. Um, obviously the machine here can only work in orchards that are where it's suited to um, and in this case it means that you've got to have a, a fruiting wall type system, a very flat hedge type uh, like system. You can use uh, this machine, just drive it, put it mounted on the front of a tractor, move down the row, it's, uh, the front of the rotor is spinning and it will knock off um, some of the flowers and by playing around with the tractor speed and the rotation speed of the rotors, um, you can be either more aggressive or less aggressive. Um, this is never enough in terms of just using up this system. Um, you will still have to do additional hand thinning or other thinning afterwards. Um, an alternative is, is this one here. This is the Bloom Bandit, and, um, which is a handheld machine, the battery pack on the back. Um, that you can use in, in more complex trees like these Fuji trees here uh, where you also just use the, the rotating head of the machine to knock off some flowers and can be quite effective to reduce uh, flowers if you know that you've, you're in a situation where you will actually have a heavy fruit set um, and you, you have too many flowers you can get rid of them uh, some of the flowers maybe about a third of the flowers in this way Hand thinning is either done during blossom, um, as in this case, blossom thinning, or you come in at a later stage and do fruitlet thinning. Uh, you can use hand thinning of blossoms together with, or in, uh, basically in the same sort of systems as the mechanical thinning, um, but only on cultivars and fruit types where you know you're going to get a very f heavy set. So you, you don't even have to wait for fruit set to occur. You know you're going to get too many fruit, so you go in and remove some, some flowers. Um, in this case, you wait till the fruit is set and then come in and remove some of them by hand. Now, unfortunately, in, in stone fruit, uh, nectarines, peaches, plums, whatever, we currently only have these two techniques available. We either have to use the machine in combination with hand thinning or we have to do only hand thinning um, because we don't have any chemicals registered. Um, hopefully in the near future we will, but at this stage we don't. Um, the other way of thinning is before bloom or even in winter is by removing a lot of your shoots, um, but then you have, in, in the case of stone fruit, like these alpines, you can see the number of flowers that are actually lying on the ground after pruning. Um, you count your number of shoots that you want to, to keep on the tree, make sure you have enough bearing wood left after pruning, and then you still have to do additional thinning of those um, individual shoots that were left. 
In the case of apples and pears, we will often do a, a, a bud analysis first to determine what percentage of our buds are reproductive or flower buds, and then according to that, we could start thinning out some of the, the flower buds with, with winter pruning or pruning during, during flowering. Okay, if we talk about chemical thinning, and again, I can't go into any details here, um, there are a number of products registered for use on, on apples, and uh, an, only a, a few products registered on, on um, pears, and currently nothing on stone fruit. Um, so we're basically using it only on, on apples and pears currently. Very important is to follow the directions given on the label, so whichever product you decide on, and I'm not going to advertise any products here, um, you use a, a product that's registered for that cultivar and you follow the timing and rate applications as indicated on the label. Um, what is very important though when you use chemicals is the effect of weather conditions when you're applying. Um, Firstly, the weather conditions prior to application play a role, but also very important, the weather conditions after you've applied the chemical. With um, very cool, uh, moist weather before application, we find that the leaves will absorb a lot more chemical. Um, the leaves are softer, and you can get a, a much stronger response um, to chemical thinners. If you have hot weather after application, again, also you get a much stronger response from your chemical thinning agents. And there are certain chemicals where it's actually specified that, that you won't get any response if you don't have temperatures above 18 degrees after application. So it doesn't even make any sense to apply it if the weather isn't warm afterwards. Uh, then you have to look at alternatives or you have to postpone your application. Um, also, the, an, a factor that plays a role is your, your tree uh, the standard of your trees, or the quality of your trees, as well as the orchard conditions. Um, you have to look at previous yields. If you have trees that are under stress, uh, they will thin more easily. If you've had a very heavy crop load the previous year, the trees will thin more easily. Um, if you have a heavy bloom, they will thin more easily. So you have to take all these things into consideration. And then, unfortunately, not all uh, even if you take something like a Golden Delicious, not all Golden Delicious orchards are the same. Um, you have to build up a history of your orchard, knowing what you've done in the past, how effective was that, and then adjust from that. So keeping records when it comes to thinning is probably one of the most important um, aspects of the whole process. So even if we look at, at something like nectarines um, or, or stone fruit, you have to have a record of what was your fruit size distribution, what was your yield per hectare, and how do I want to adjust that? Was my actual average fruit size too small? Then I have to be a bit more aggressive in my thinning action. And it doesn't matter how I thin, whether I use mechanical or hand thinning um, or chemical thinning, I have to adjust uh, depending on, on what my records tell me. So keep very accurate records, monitor certain trees in the orchard, and then make adjustments in, in the next years if you want to have either more aggressive or less aggressive thinning. Okay, this is what we would like to see. This is a Fuji um, bearing unit uh, with a combination of products applied where we keep the, the king flower or the king fruitlet, which will be the biggest of the fruit in the cluster, um, whereas the, the, all the laterals are going to, to drop. Okay, and that's what you want to see when you come into the orchard afterwards, um, is to find all these little fruitlets on the ground um, to know that you've effectively actually thinned. Even if you do chemical thinning, you probably will have to come in and do some additional hand thinning afterwards, although I think we, we're trying to aim at really thinning more aggressively with, with the chemicals so that we have very little hand thinning to do in addition to the chemical thinning. Okay, to talk about fruit set improvement, um, we're actually limited in, in what we can do. Um, apart from optimizing the pollination, as I already said before, we can use certain pruning cuts. Um, and one that I also referred to this morning already is the so-called ring cut, where we, we cut at that um, junction there between the one and two-year-old wood. 
or we can even go deeper into the two-year-old wood and improve the fruit set on those positions. Um, I won't go into detail as to how it works, but it is quite an effective tool and um, you can see I'm old and gray. When I was a student, um, one of the biggest problems we had was getting a good yield on, on Packhams uh, until they discovered the ring cut and since then um, setting a good crop on Packhams is, is less of an issue than it, it, it was before. Okay, the other option is pinching um, and I don't think it's always a practical option but what it really means is you've got this typical um, situation in apples and, and pears where we have a, a cluster with some burr shoots developing and these burr shoots very often are very strong sinks and take away uh, or compete very strongly with the little fruitlets and by breaking out those growing tips um, we can actually improve the set of, uh, of the, the flowers in the clusters um, of those, where those burr shoots are. Um, you can imagine though that going through an orchard and breaking out little growing tips is, is quite labor intensive. Um, we also have some growth regulators that we can use, um, very effective especially in, in pairs, is to use either GA3 or GA47 um, I think only GA3 is registered on Forel, but I know a lot of people are also using GA47. Um, that's one option of, of improving fruit set. And then we can also improve fruit set by using a product like Regalis, which uh, prevents very strong shoot growth. So you reduce the, the competition of the, the shoot growth that's happening at the same time as fruit set. So that's another option we have to, that we can use. Okay, and then the last aspect, five minutes, whoops. Okay, uh, fruit growth. <coughs> Seven, okay, thanks Elton. Um, right, the last step is optimizing fruit growth. Now, what we have here is, if you really look at the little flower and the base of the flower, it's that part of the flower that develops into the fruit. <coughs> I've turned the apple in this position, so that's the, st the stem sticking out there and at the calyx end we have the remains of, of the, uh, the um, anthers and the, and the styles and, and also the, uh, the calyx. Okay, so it's really trying to improve the growth of that part of the flower into a, a proper big fruit. And I'm only going to look at apples here. Um, we're starting off with a cluster of flowers, as I said, and we grow that with a single sigmoidal curve. The initial growth is, is relatively slow, speeds up, and then it slows again towards the end in, in the, optimizing the final size. Now the first stage is a stage of cell division. So the number of cells in that lower part of the flower increases through cell division, and then afterwards there's cell enlargement taking place. Um, that first period in the case of apples is about four weeks and that's it. After that, the number of cells in the flower or the um, receptacle of the flower is fixed and they can only increase in size from that point onwards. Okay, so what do we do to stimulate cell division? Um, we want to have as many cells as possible because the best quality fruit would be a fruit of a specific size but with as many small cells as possible. Okay, so the more cells the better. Um, cell division is stimulated by cytokinins. Okay, so that's a, a, an an, a hormone that's present in the, in the tree. But we can apply cytokinins and spraying Maxell is, is which we do as a, as a chemical thinner, we can also use to stimulate cell division in that first four week period. The earlier we thin and the fewer, the quicker we get to the point where we have a limited number of, of um, fruitlets left on the tree, the better for those remaining fruitlets. Um, for instance, if we, we can do that thinning early with pruning, it's very, very important, but we can also already thin flowers and or very small fruitlets. This is just an example. If you did uh, thinning in the pink bud stage, you would end up in a, with a fruit of about 49 million cells. If you do the thinning one week after full bloom, you only have 46 million 
two weeks after 43, three weeks after full bloom, you end up with 36 million cells, and if you didn't thin at all, and you had a very heavy crop set, it, you end up with only 27 million see, uh, cells. This doesn't mean this fruit is half the size of this one. Um, the individual cells will blow up and, and become relatively big, but remember what, we, what I said, we want as many cells as possible so that those cells are relatively small. You can just imagine a fruit with a lot of small cells inside is a lot more, um, uh, as, as a, lot, a lot better quality than one with a few very blown up balloons inside. Okay, very important is that the, the, the position where the flower cluster is formed plays an important role in the quality of the flower because if I go back to this, I didn't start this graph at the bottom, at zero, okay? Because there are already cells present in that little flower receptacle at point of full bloom, but that is dependent on the quality of the flower. So certain bearing positions, and Nigel showed it to you this morning, he had a, a two-year-old section with some flower buds sitting on spurs pointing upwards, talking about the dorsal buds, they are much better quality than the spurs pointing downwards. So if you're going to thin out some flowers, already with pruning, cut off those spurs pointing downwards. Reduce the spurs where you will have weaker quality flowers. The last point, the previous crop load. Remember, these flower buds are busy differentiating during the time that the, the previous year's crop is on the, on the tree. So if you have too heavy a crop load, you will end up with half the number of cells in your flowers than when you've got a normal crop load. So over bearing too many fruits in one season, you'll have a negative effect on your fruit size the next season. Okay, the cell enlargement, that's the part where the fruit really increases in size. It happens better when there are fewer fruits on the tree, um, fewer cells per fruit, but that's not necessarily what we want. If you excessively fertilize with nitrogen, you're gonna stimulate cell size but that will mean also you will increase the bruisability of your fruit. Um, very important during this time though is that you need optimal irrigation because for the cell to grow in size, it needs a pre turgor pressure inside the, f the cell, so you need enough water. And then one can um, improve this with also using gibberellins. It will increase fruit in, uh, cell enlargement, but be very careful if you do use it. Um, I actually don't uh, see it as a, as a really as an option because you will have, be, have to be very careful not to reduce the return bloom for the next season. And then the last aspect is just the, all the factors that will influence your final fruit size. Um, your position in the cluster, the, the king flower is the better quality flower, so if you can set the king flower, that's the one that will give you the, the biggest and best quality fruit, or should. The more seeds, um, there is a positive correlation with seed number and fruit size, um, especially in apples, but it's, it only explains about 30% of final fruit size. But the more seeds, normally the better quality and b better size fruit you will have. Um, your earlier flowers are normally your, your better quality flowers. So again, setting your, your early flowers on the tree uh, gives you better fruit size. Um, fr fruit thinning has to happen as quickly as possible to reduce the competition with your other fruit. Uh, temperature plays a role. Um, oops. The h higher spring temperatures gives you better cell division and better winter uh, temperatures or enough chilling units in winter will give you more uh, or better quality flowers. So firstly, your winter temperatures are important. You want cold winters, but you want um, relatively warm springs. And then as I mentioned before, your pruning, um, keeping the, the best quality flowers on the tree and reducing the, the, the actual flower clusters by pruning is important. And then one can use growth regulators like Maxell. Um, I prefer not to use gibberellins. And then also by spraying something like Retain right at the end of the season, you can uh, postpone your harvest with about a week and increase a little bit uh, fruit size through that. Thank you.